Good evening again, Gasol Baptist Church. I'm glad that you've tuned in tonight. Uh, I want us to turn uh, to Philippians chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. Tonight I wanted to look at something uh, that we all need reminded of. It's things we know, but I think I need reminded, so hopefully you do also. It's, it's how does God's family act, or how are we supposed to act as members of God's family? And uh, we begin with uh, Philippians chapter 2, verse 1. Paul says, Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. Uh, then he goes on, let this mind, this mind, this, this mind from the Holy Spirit, this mind of God, be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider uh, to be robbery, to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking on the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men, being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself, became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God has also highly exalted him, giving a name which above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and those on earth, and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved brethren, as you've always obeyed me, not as in my presence only, but also much more in my absence, work out your own salvation. With fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. Do all things without complaining, without disputing, that you become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the day. We thank you for this scripture. Open our eyes by the power of your Holy Spirit. Help us to apply it to our lives and live it so that we can grow thereby. And we thank you for all your manifold blessings, Lord. Speak to us now as only you can. We pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. I think I've shared before my, my first day at work. Uh, uh, I, I, I left my uh, home and I started work the first day before school was to start the next day college was to start and uh, uh, later that evening I got a whack a frozen biscuit hit the back of my head man it hurt and uh, I, I turned around real fast mad and then I saw this this cook coming towards me now this cook and I became good friends her name's LT and LT uh, let's just say she was a black mama and she pointed her mama finger at me and said, What do you mean, preacher boy? You came in here and you haven't said a word to any of us all night. How can you be God's man if you don't God, love God's children? Said, My, and she said a bad word and patted her bottom and said, Maybe you're black. But I am still God's child and if you're God's man, you're called to love me. And I had to apologize profusely because she was right. I'd gone in there scared to death. I'd never been around colored folks before. And so I, I didn't act the way I should have acted. And from that moment on, I made sure I said hi to everybody in the kitchen before I started my work. No more frozen biscuits for me. But she had a, a truth there that God had to work into me over the next four years. And that was this. Christians should always treat, treat each other Christians should always treat each other with agape love, God's kind of love. It doesn't matter whether we're rich or poor, black or white or polka dotted. It doesn't matter. We're to treat one another as God's family, and God's family has a certain way it's supposed to act, and that's what I want to focus on in this passage of scriptures. How God's family is supposed to act if we really belong to Christ, if we've really accepted Him as Lord and Savior, it shows up 
in how we act towards one another, especially. The best witness we have in our communities, in our world, is how we treat one another. The worst message we have can be how we fail to treat one another correctly. And so I wanted to look in verses 1 through 4, first of all, and see that there's a conduct that we're encouraged toward. A conduct we're encouraged toward. First of all, notice in verse 1 that it flows from a personal relationship in Jesus Christ. It flows from a personal relationship in Christ. He goes through here in verse 1, and you listen to all the ifs. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if there's any comfort of love, if there's any fellowship in the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, and then he goes on. The ifs there are a small participle, D-E-I, we've discussed it before, and it can be translated since in a Greek construction. And really it's assumed as true. Yes, there is a consolation in Christ. And it means encouragement in Christ. All right? If there's any fellowship in the Spirit, it means yes, there's fellowship in the Spirit among us as believers. If there's any affection of mercy, yes, there is all these things. Let's see, the encouragement there is literally God and, and His uh, Holy Spirit whispering encouragement in our ears to keep going. It, it, it means that, that we have somebody to help us. And so the ifs are assumed as true. There are all these things for us, all of us, in Christ. Any comfort of love, any consolation of Christ, any fellowship of the Spirit, any affection and mercy. Those are the ways we're to treat one another with affection, with mercy, knowing that the Holy Spirit speaks and works through us all to build up the body, to witness to the world. And so it's a, it starts with a personal relationship with Christ. It's, it's, the, it's the, really the key, all right? It, it, if you don't have a personal relationship in Christ, you don't have the fruit of the Spirit. If you don't have a personal relationship in Christ, you don't love the brethren. Uh, John, 1 John goes so far to say, if you don't love your brother, how can you say you love God? Because you've seen your brother, you haven't seen God, and therefore you're a liar. People who just can't get along in church, something's wrong with their relationship this way because they can't have a good relationship this way. Now that's not being judgmental. You just watch, they go from church to church to church and it's always the other guy's fault. Something's wrong. Watch out for those folks. So it, 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 it's a conduct we're encouraged toward, and it flows from a personal relationship in Christ. But notice verse 2, that personal relationship in Christ, because all these ifs are true, results in unity. It results in unity. He says, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Now he states it three different ways. All right? He says... To fulfill his joy, make his joy complete. How? By being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. He keeps just saying that all these things produce unity. Unity is a key for a church to be successful. Unity is a key for us to love one another the way God would have us to love. It's a command for joy. In other words, if we want the joy of Christ, it has to be a like-mindedness, a one-mindedness, a uh, same love, uh, being of one accord, okay? And uh, so that's it. It, it. The third thing under that point of, of the conduct we're encouraged toward is respect for one another. In verse 3, he says it this way. How does our respect for another, one another show up? Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. And he goes on in verse 4 about respect. Let each one of you look out not only for his own interest, but for the interest of others. Do we understand that? Um, it's the principle here of self-denial. Jesus taught this repeatedly uh, through the uh, New Testament when he was here. But as we live together as Christian brothers and sisters, we're trying to walk in uh, love, that demands humbleness. It, it means we give up our rights. It, it means we guard against pride, which causes divisions and strife. 
Jesus said it this way in, in Luke 9, 23 and 24. He said, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily. All right. And he goes on in Matthew 19, 30, and he says, uh, the first will be last and the last will be first. It's an upside down principle. It means that, that those who walk in humbleness are blessed by God. But when we are humble and not thinking ourselves better than others, it causes unity in the church. There's not a single person that's truly a child of God that didn't come to Christ the same way we all did. By confessing our sins and placing our faith in Jesus, we're all sinners. That's why there's so much strife oftentimes in churches. But we need to remember that, and we need to take up our cross, which is the way of death, daily. We need to uh, give our bodies as living sacrifices. We need to make sure that we're following Christ, and we realize the first will be last, and the last will be first. And and Jesus gave us an example of that. He didn't make it a command to wash each other's feet. But the example was, see how I'm serving you. Serve one another this way. Because the lowest servant in a Greek household of Jesus' day, or a Hebrew household, the slave of slaves would wash whoever came in, wash their feet, wash the grime off, get a little bit of refreshment. It was an absolute humiliating job. And Christ did it to his apostles and said, we should have that same type of love to serve one another. And it's, it's a conduct we're encouraged towards. And he says, if you do these things, you're going to experience that joy that I'm talking about, that consolation. We need to understand that. It's unity. It's a family of believers. It's a conduct that we're to present to the world. I'll never forget uh, being a Boy Scout and, and going out in the woods and camping, and that was fun. And one of our leaders... Had, you've seen this object lesson before, I'm sure, but he had a great big bundle of sticks we were going to build a fire with. And he'd hand them to each of us. There were six of us there. And he said, try to break this over your knee. And so we'd hit it. You could hit it as hard as you wanted to. You could even step on it until it hurt your ankle or bruised your knee, and it wouldn't break. And he said, now watch this, boys. He untied the bundle and handed us one, and they snapped real easy. And his object lesson was, look, <clears throat> when there's unity in a group, there's strength. Do we understand that Christ wants us to be unified and show love to the world because the world is a hard place to get through? We're not called to do it on our own. We're called to do it as a family of God, one body in a local church. And it's hard to be broken when we're all together, when we're unified. The devil can whack and whack, but he can't break that bond of fellowship when we're unified in Christ's love. And we need to ask, what are we doing to promote unity in our church? Are we loving one another so we feel like we're on the same page? What might we be doing that's causing disunity? Do we understand uh, that the book of Proverbs tells us uh, in verse 619 that God hates those who sow discord among the brethren? All right, do we understand that? And we're supposed to love fellow believers Believers, we're supposed to stand unified against the world. That doesn't mean in a hostile military way, but it means they don't penetrate us. We stand for what Christ wants us to do because we love people, because we love somebody, because we treat each other correctly. It's winsome. It draws others to Christ. We're literally the light of the world. We're the salt of the earth. They want what we have. They're thirsty for the love they see us expressing toward one another. Hope that made sense. It's a conduct we're encouraged towards. But there's also a command with which we've been entrusted. It's in verses 5 through 11. Let this mind be in you. All right, what mind? Which was also in Christ Jesus. Okay, what did he do? Who being in the form of God, did not consider to be robbery, to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking on the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself, became obedient to the point of death, even the awfulness of the death of the cross. Therefore God also has highly exalted him, giving him a name which is above every name, that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. There's coming a day, if you don't do it now, you're going to do it unwillingly. Every knee should bow of those in heaven, of those on earth, of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess to the glory of God the Father that Jesus Christ is Lord of all. 
Do we understand that? So, what's he saying here in this command? In verse, verse 5, it, 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 it's, it's the imitation would have. He says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And, and in Matthew 5, 4, 8, he says, therefore you be perfect, and your Father in heaven is imperfect. In Matthew 12, or 2 Peter 2, I'm sorry, I'll get it out in a minute. 2 Peter 2, beginning verse 21, it says, For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it turn away from the holy commandment delivered to them. All right, and what he's saying in there, look, you, you don't come and hear and leave unchanged. You're under greater judgment because you know the truth. But as it happened to them, according to the proverb, a dog returns to his own vomit and a sow has been washed to her wallowing in the mire. It's a dangerous thing, and we need to understand that. Uh, it's out of Proverbs 26, 11, if you're looking for that proverb. But what he's saying is, look, there's, you're to imitate Christ in his mind, what he did for us. How humble he became, leaving all of heaven's glory, coming to walk sinful sod as flesh and blood. In other words, he was 100% God, 100% man. He lived sinlessly to show us that's it, that he could do it. That's what God's original plan for us was. But we were marred. We were sin. And then he died on the cross. He rose from the dead after three days. He ascended to the Father, and eventually he's coming back. But all that has to tell us, look, you know the way of truth. Walk in that truth. We're to imitate Christ's mind, not thinking me better than you or I have better gifts or you have better gifts and me being jealous. No, we love one another. We support one another. Then there was the emptying. We already said that. He laid aside everything and came as one man. And then finally, there's the exaltation. God gave him a name above every name. His name is Jesus. Now, let me boil it down. The command set before us is simply be like Jesus. We're all Christians. That means little Christ of the party of Christ. We represent Christ. We're to be like Jesus. One of the best examples I ever read of someone being like Jesus uh, could be found if you would go to the country of Algiers. There's a little church there. And on a plaque there, it has the name of Devereux Spratt. You think, who is Devereux Spratt? He was an Englishman. And he and about 120 others were captured by the Algerian pirates of that day. And they made him a slave and they built the fortifications around Algiers. And finally, his brother paid enough ransom that he was ransomed. The word came down that he was supposed to be let go. Well, this caused great concern among them because here's what Devereux Spratt did. Looking around him as they started as slaves and building and were beat and almost starved and mistreated, he saw his fellow prisoners despair without hope. But he knew true hope. He had a smile on his face even while he was working or being beaten. Even when things were bad, he was praying and singing psalms to God. And he began to lead these men to Christ. And he gathered these fellow believers around him and they formed a little church. And they were allowed to worship on Sundays and then go back to their work. And they were so happy he was going to be free. If anybody deserved it, Devereux Spratt deserved it. A true servant of Christ. And they were so happy they were just upset that they were going to lose their leader. But Devereux Spratt, looking around him, realized that God had called him to win more to Christ and to develop these believers. And he refused to leave them. And he died a slave of a slave, working for everybody in that place. And his name still remembered on that plaque. See, when we talk about a command to exercise, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. That's a big command. But we need to understand it works this way. Are you here to serve in the church? Or are you here to be served by the church? Some people serve and give everything for the church of Jesus Christ, serving Jesus in the church, for the kingdom. Some people only want the church around when they need something. And they use the church in a lot of ways. Well, I need this or I need that or I want to, and they want to be served. So what is your purpose here? Do you want recognition or do you want God's name to be glorified? It boils down to this. Do we have the mind of Christ in us? And the easiest test is this. What do I consider too expensive to sacrifice for Christ? My reputation, uh, my position, uh, my influence in the church. 
See, I'm not telling you to have a bad reputation. I'm not telling you not to have a good influence. But what I'm saying is, is it about you or is it about Christ? Is it about me or is it about Jesus? See, the command is, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. That means a lot of things very practically if you want to apply it. Now, I'm going to say this, and it's going to upset some people, but it won't be the first time, probably won't be the last. And I don't say this in a hateful way. The music we listen to, the music that we listen to either draws us towards Christ or repels us away from Christ. Um, now, growing up, I, I listen to Christian music because it helps me. But growing up, I listened to rock and roll, and I loved it. And even today, every once in a while, all those songs will come on, and if I'm not careful, I get the wrong mind real quick. Matter of fact, Elizabeth, one day, uh, we were working around the house doing spring cleaning, which I hate, by the way. But she knew to get me revved up, she played some of that music I used to listen to. And it wasn't very long, my attitude had changed, and my attitude affected my actions, and pretty soon she shut that music off and put Caleb on. Because it affects us. If I'm going to have the mind of Christ... She's like a computer, the old thing, garbage in, garbage out. Same thing, what we watch, you know, it goes on and on. I'm not saying be so separated from the world that you don't know what people are watching or listening to. I want you to hear me. But make sure that it's not changing you like the world, but rather you are transforming above it through Bible study, through prayer, through uh, service. Let's go on. The third thing that I see here is the commendation. Okay, which, which we're enlivened. You see, in verses 12 through 13, it says that, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed me, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation. With fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to do his good pleasure. Do all things, here goes, oh, I hate these verses, do all things without complaining and disputing, that you become blameless, and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. You see, what he's saying here to me is there's a commendation coming. We're looking forward to that day. But its basis is on obedience. He said, look, You've obeyed in the past, continue to obey. In verse 12 and verse 13, he reminds us that this, this is born of God because he says, uh, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. God has a plan and a purpose for our lives. He who began a good work in you will complete it to the day of Christ. You can do all things in Christ who strengthens you. And my God shall supply all your needs in Christ Jesus through his riches and glory. It's in God. It's God's work. We're to let him have it. It is built into our lives. He says, do it without complaining or grumbling. Uh, I don't know about you, but Baptist preachers are known to grumble on Monday mornings. It's not a good thing. It's better for me to go out and talk to the cows and grumble at them and watch their ears lower as they walk off because they don't want to hear it. God's like that. But you see, blamelessness is accomplished when we don't grumble and complain and gossip and backbite. I like the way my father-in-law used to say it. He said, Gary, church is like a bank. The more you put into it, the more interest you get. Congregation, brothers and sisters in Christ, church is like a bank. The more you put into it, the more interest you get. Do we understand that? Again, the Bible says very plainly in Proverbs 6, 19, and then in verses 16 through 19, uh, it says, He hates those who sow discord among the brethren, murmuring, Gumbling, complaining, gossiping have no place in God's children because that is not loving each other like Jesus loved us. And we need to remember that. As we look forward to uh, Valentine's Day this Sunday, we talk about, oh, love. But what about God's kind of love? Not just romantic love between men and women or boyfriend and girlfriend or husband and wife, but love towards Christian brothers and sisters are true, genuine. I care about your welfare. I want you to be successful. I want you to be blessed. And I'm praying for that. That kind of love. So we need to strive to be blameless. 
Most churches, not ours, but most churches remind me of the guy that was rescued off a of desert island. He'd been there 10 years. And he walked and said, that's my house. And they said, well, what's that building over there? Well, that's the first church I went to. The first church, he said, yeah, I go not to that one either, but the third church down there. He said, well, what was wrong with the first one? I couldn't get along with them. Remember, he's the only one on the desert island. Most of the time we're saying, well, if they would do this or they would do that, and God wants to say, well, what about you? Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to do this? And we need to remember that. To love one another means... I give up my rights, my privileges. Isn't that what Jesus did when he left all of heaven's glory and came to be a, a man, a humble carpenter, didn't even have a place to lay his head, who suffered so horribly on the cross, physically and spiritually, so that he could save us if we would accept his work. He had the right to call down a legion of angels and wipe everybody out for the way they were treating him, spitting in his face plucking his beard, calling him vile names. And who were they? Sinners like me and like you. If he can do that for me, then I have to swallow things and say, Lord, you did much more for me than this. I can handle it. And the Holy Spirit has to remind me of that constantly. And sometimes I fail and sometimes I don't. But I'm striving to do what he wants. Have a good week, be careful, and pray for one another. And every chance you get, show love to the brethren and to those outside the church. They're watching us. Thanks.